we need to get the other player to talk to them. We need to shame this one player on social media. And it's like, no, the answer is hire a goddamn referee. And they give out a few red cards and they enforce rules of the game. And, and we do have rules, right? And they're just not updated. Hi, I'm Carson Block with Zeros TV. And I'm here today with Tariq Fancy, who's an apostate. Tariq used to head ESG investing at BlackRock, and he recently left concluding that at BlackRock or in an ESG investing in general, he was doing more harm than good in terms of solving the world's problems. There is no evidence that any ESG ETF has any positive social impact that I've seen. So Tariq, very, very interesting to have you here. And I mean, more harm than good. How, how do we get there? So first I'd say actually I was chief investment officer for sustainable investing. That part's kind of important because one of the things I found that was kind of fascinating when I entered the sustainable investing space is that there was not a lot of people with investment backgrounds. You know, it's kind of like joining, you know, you join Facebook and you know, there's an ethical programming division and then you get in and you realize no one's ever written, you know, any code before, right? It's, 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 it's not always the best opening sign. Um, but, uh, you know, I went in and I fully drank the Kool-Aid. I believe that ESG has value to investing, right? Which is kind of a proxy for saying that, you know, more, pro more responsible and good companies, you know, make more profits. It's something we all want to believe. And I just ended up finding that it was massively exaggerated, right? Like as a trained investor, I had done, I had done distressed investing, skip, skeptical mindset. You know, you come in and, and you expect there to be some real value in this and you start to figure out that this is a data set that, you know, that, that is vaguely useful in a few instances, but, you know, we're not talking about it because of its importance to investing. We're talking about it because it includes the words environmental and social at a time that society is demanding that something be done more than what's happening. And so I found that there was very little investment value. There's a kernel of truth that was being blown up. And even worse, there's like next to no social impact out of any of that stuff, right? And so it was only after I left that I came back to the, the charity I now run. I'd founded it before that. I, I'd left Wall Street in the first place to create a, uh, a nonprofit tech charity that I was really passionate about. And that was, you know, that's kind of what gave me the credibility to, to, to do both bottom lines. And I came back and I started paying attention early, early 2020 at how leaders were, you know, were responding. And it was very clear when COVID hit that they understood that you need government action for these things, you need like, you know, systemic regulation to bend down and flatten the curve. That's exactly what policy experts are telling us we need for climate change, right? And for inequality. And yet you had a bunch of these leaders are telling us that ESG is the answer and stakeholder capitalism and just spinning a yarn that is clearly delaying the public. And so I realized that the analogy I, I used was that ESG and sustainable investing and all these products were like giving wheatgrass to a cancer patient, right? The cancer spreading We've marketed this really well, but there's no impact out of any of it. And there's no reason to even believe that any of it would have any impact. And then I realized it's even worse because you realize that the, the, the cancer patient is delaying chemo because we're, you know, we're aggressively selling this wheatgrass as the next big thing. And at that point, you realize that this is actually not harmless. It's actually probably harmful and will be remembered, you know, years from now as this period of fantasies where, you know, we told us there was win-win solutions where you can buy a low carbon ETF and fight climate change and it distracted us from the fact that like we've known for decades, it's obviously a carbon tax. At the outset, you believed that capital markets could help provide solutions. I'm sure you didn't think that capital markets would solve all problems here, but why is it then that capital markets are not part of the solution? And what's what's the what's the disconnect? And and also I'd, I'd love to understand you, you alluded to it um, just now, but I mean, was there a single moment in which you said, wow, okay, this, this capital markets cannot help tame the environmental, the social ills of this world? You know, the, so I should clarify, I think capital markets are at the center of solving the problem. They have to be part of it by definition. The challenge is that won't just happen on its own, because right now you have a system where all of the operators in the system are constrained by the straitjacket of fiduciary duty, right? So one way or another, either legally or through their financial incentives, they're all pretty much trying to do the most profitable thing, the most, you know, the most, the highest return thing, you know, that, that's how they're built to operate is, you know, focusing on dollar values, not social values, right? 
fine. The system operates that way for a reason, you know, so it's fine to recognize that. But you also have that combined with market failures, where under any scenario, we know with the example of climate change, for example, that, you know, it's cheaper to burn fossil fuels than it should be because there's no cost on the pollution that is being incurred, right? It is being incurred to future generations. Someone deals with it, but but no, not the person burning it now, right? So more is being burnt than we need. We know that. Is there progress? Yes. Is it as fast as we need? Definitely not. And as long as you have the system, capital markets, entire system themselves don't have those externalities priced in, right? They won't just magically do it on their own. So the ESG idea is that like, they're just going to price this in and, and, and do it. And it's like, no, I mean, transparency helps, data helps, but the market failure still needs to, you know, you still need referees in a sports game. You know what I mean? Like there, there is a role to play for them. So when you say that we need referees, I mean, what are you what are you talking about? Are you talking about significant amounts of regulation um, or are you talking about just little tweaks to the marketplace? I mean, what do you envision the way to actually positively affect change and how that can work together with capital markets? I think it's not a right. It's like a thicket of new regulations as much because I think it's not so much about the quantity of the regulations as much as it is about what they actually say and do. So in a lot of areas in the economy, there's far too much regulation and it doesn't make sense, frankly, right? There's all kinds of weird protectionist things and, you know, they're just there because of legacy reasons or whatever. At the same time, you do need some level of regulation on the most important things. So, for example, if we really want to protect the natural environment, you know, I personally haven't seen the center of the machine would tell you that the answer is not relying on the CSR promises of, you know, big oil or really any company that is structured from the ground up to create profits, right? I mean... In theory, right, they're all going to have divisional, you know, budgets, P&Ls, like every step through that system of the, of the corporation is being built to maximize profits. And so, you know, you just can't rely on them. I, I don't say that as an attacker on capitalism. I'm a capitalist, right? I'm a former investment banker. I have an MBA. But also, I'm, I'm, I think there has to be a recognition in the system of how the system operates and the fact that there are levers to create change. For example, government regulations to protect the environment, to tax pollution, and so on. And I think until we realize that those are the case, like right now we're focused on ESG statements, CSR, you know, annual reports, you know, just a whole bunch of stuff that is like words, right? It's just really just marketing. And we're seeing every year ESG words increase, ESG assets increase, and they're increasing alongside like carbon emissions and inequality and all the things they're actually meant to address because there's really no link between the two. You bring up an interesting point because I know something that you've you've mentioned um, is that the signatories to that business roundtable letter in which they the CEOs extolled the virtues of stakeholder capitalism or at least thinking more comprehensively um, about the impacts of businesses on the environment and on our social structures that there was actually a study done that shows that not, I think it was what 98% of those companies um, yeah. spent you know, significantly more or had more safety or OSHA violations than their peers spent more on lobbying than their peers. Um, is am I, am I remembering things correctly? And it's right. Yeah. And, and so, yeah. so it's interesting if you, you know, I mean, your view that we need, we need more rules effectively, but the signatories to this, the people who are really, the companies that are really touting how aware they've become are, it seems like actively, they're in the vanguard of fighting against those additional rules. Is that perception correct? I'd say so, yeah. I mean, in, in a sense, if you look at the stakeholder capitalism stuff, I mean, it's kind of like if you had a sport, right? And there were players and they were playing dirty in that sport. Let's say it's soccer or something. And they're playing dirty and they're fouling people. And they've been doing it for 20 years because it helps them win games, right? Then what you're going to find is that when someone tries to close the loophole by saying, like, where the hell are the refs? The first thing they're going to say is, what refs? Like, we don't need refs. You know, good sportsmanship. That's the answer, which is effectively what stakeholder capitalism is, right? It comes at a point where probably haven't had smart regulation on key areas for years. And so they're, and they're trying to keep it away. And I think what is the most kind of a little bit annoying about it in a way, right? Is that if you look at what's happening today, on one hand, they're selling things like stakeholder capitalism, 
right? Which stakeholder cabinet looks like in 1954 when the cigarette industry put out something called the Frank Statement to Cigarette Smokers. And they were like, we care about your health. And we all know afterwards, it was just to like keep regulation away as long as possible and just muddy the waters, no, no pun intended, to, to, um, you know, to, to delay regulation. And so that's what stakeholder capitalism is. Who's done more research on the subject than the good people at the American tobacco industry? They say it's harmless. Why would they lie? If you're dead, you can't smoke. Huh. But the worst part about it is, is that they're, they're using one hand to delay taxes and regulation. And then in the growing social angst that's opening up in between, because people are like, what the hell are we doing on climate change? And look at inequality and spilling into the streets. They're using the other hand to sell a bunch of green crap, right? It's a whole bunch of products that like all of these ESG ETFs, there's no measurable impact out of any of them, right? They, they can't measure a thing. And they're selling it clearly to people who believe that by buying it and paying 43% greater fees, they must be doing some, creating some impact that wouldn't have otherwise happened when none of that's the case. And the worst part, all of that is being done under the guise of responsible business, right? And if you stop and think about it, you're kind of like, wait a second, like, you know, if you have a CEO who's 68 or something, it's like clearly in their interest to do it. But it's not clear to me it's in their own employees' interests, right? If you're a 20 or 30 or 40 year old at BlackRock, you know, the longer we kick the can down the road on climate change, the worse it's going to be, right? And we clearly understand the need to use smart regulation to bend down the COVID curve, right? We use mandatory masks. We use, you know, restricted international travel, closed high-risk venues like schools and bars. And, you know, as tough as that was, the U.S. would have lost millions of people if that didn't happen, right? It, something needed to be done. And so they understand the need to bend down a curve when it's coming quickly, right? And it affects their own interests financially um, and health-wise. But when it comes to a slow-moving curve, right, we got to burn, we got to bend down the greenhouse gas emissions curve. They all claim, claim to believe in science, that they believe it's real. But then when it comes to the policy suggestions, right, like 2018, the Nobel Prize in economics was given to a guy who's been saying for decades that we need a carbon tax. They're still out there saying that the answer is not the same kind of government action for a systemic crisis again, because it's slow moving. They're like, no, the free market will solve it. Let's make, you know, voluntary net zero pledges. And you're like, like it's a market failure. It's clearly cheaper for people to do than we need it to be for them, you know. And and you know, like and you have all these like sort of voluntary compliance things that like they're just clearly not going to work. I've read a draft essay that you've written, which is just fantastic piece. And all kidding aside, could probably be adapted into a screenplay of of some sort. But you talked a few minutes ago about corporate culture, and one of the things that strikes me from reading your essay and the various anecdotes of the ESG or sustainable investing events that you attended is there seems to be this, this very decadent or epicurean culture, at least, you know, uh, that corporates marry to this idea of sustainability. And um, you seem to, you seem to point out, that cognitive dissonance, you know, riding around on a, on a G550 to try to push sustainable products. But I mean, could you describe that culture? I mean, do I have it or are these good adjectives to describe it? Can you describe that culture of, of corporate sustainability? And does that have something to do with, I mean, this really self-defeating um, form of sustainability. And, and, you know, I know you also contrasted at one point to Greta Turnberg, who really is quite, you know, I mean, lives a seemingly monastic life as opposed to the private jets in galas. Yeah. I mean, well, you, you summed it up, right? I mean, it's, it's kind of just business as usual with moral righteousness sprinkled on top. There's a certain amount of privilege in it because I think that there used to be a conception that in order to do good, and to help people who need it or to, you know, again, help the environment or, or contribute to society over the long term, right? The long term public interest, which in theory is and everyone should be invested in. You, you have to make some level of sacrifice, right? You got to spend some time. You got to donate some money. You got to, you know, something's got to be given up. Um, and it's not, you know, just this magical win win. And somehow that has disappeared. And there's this kind of idea that, well, no. Like we can have everything we used to have and it's going to be the exact same as it was. 
and it's and then we get on top of so we're standing on the same stage eating the same caviar whatever all of the same sort of thing and then it's like also we get to feel like we're saving the world at the same time and it's all based on these win-win fantasies that win for those people it, it is a win because they're already on the right side of most of these issues and now they're making money off selling wheatgrass that doesn't solve the problem but you clearly see that the you know the people on the outside are not going to benefit out of that right i mean the cans getting kicked down the road they probably don't understand how the system works they're being heavily marketed to to convince them that the system is changing when in fact it's not right and and um yeah it's i, I would summarize it by saying it's this kind of like flashy glossy kind of world of excess it's excess combined with moral righteousness undeserved i would say so what do you think the mentality of the business leaders who participate in this decadent form of ESG is? I mean, do, are they are they crass and cynical about it saying, you know, yeah, this is all bullshit, you know, but it's going to be a fun gala? Or is this basically just an ESG veneer painted on top of their corporate existence that allows them to sleep a little bit better at night, um, you know, feeling like they've washed away some of the guilt. I mean, how really, how craven are the people who lead this movement? I don't think there's people sitting there thinking, let's screw everybody, right? I mean, I think that's the net result of, of what's, what's happening, but I don't think most people know how the system even works. It's almost like a lot of this stuff landed at these financial firms almost by accident. Like they weren't really asking for it. It was people are demanding things are done in society to make it better, particularly inequality and in, in climate. I always think are the two main ones, um, meaning also racial inequality and economic. And, and so you have like this press to do something, right? And, and those would should arguably be the remit of government, right? Like there's a reason why the US had better outcomes in terms of inequality, inclusive economy, environmental protection in the 50s, 60s and 70s. And yet there was no acronym ESG nor was there like a parallel financial system of like premium price green assets that were like, you know, meant to undo what the regular economy is doing, right? It's just because government did their job. And Nixon, of all people, like founded the EPA in 1970, right? But what's happened since the 80s is you have these really just free market ideologies that I don't really think are even about the free market. They're just about preserving at this point the status quo for people who benefit. Uh, and so those have emerged since the 80s. And it's kind of like, you have a balloon being pressed, right? <clears throat> and the, the government's not doing anything. So all that pressure goes somewhere else and it lands for all these companies, right? They're saying, well, what are you doing? Especially when Trump is president, right? What are you doing about all of these issues I care about? Because clearly, you know, that Trump is not gonna do anything. And so you have all these firms and they're kind of like, well, which, you know, we have to do something. And I think a lot of CEOs are not sure what they should be doing, right? They're sort of like, this is not my job. So why, why am I even being asked to do it? There's some that get it and they, they want to do something, but I think they're not being honest about the limitations of what a group of pr profit maximizing companies can achieve, you know, in place of a, you know, a government that's not stepping in. And so you just kind of have a mixture of these things. And I think a few people at the top definitely know how the system works, right? They know that these are market failures and you can't address them with marketing, right? And so, you know, they know that, and, and you know, they know it because of how they reacted to COVID-19, right? It wasn't like they were like, oh, let's let the ESG, right? Like, you know, at certain times they realize, okay, like we need aggressive government action, but they don't want that for climate because it's going slow. And so they're sort of happy to just watch it go along. And I think most of the people in the middle of the system who actually work in the ESG space, I don't think that they actually realize, I don't think they've zoomed out for the most part and seen that they think they're helping, but actually there's nothing in it. It's mostly marketing and it's coming as a placebo and a delay to what the experts are actually saying. Like there's zero experts that say we should like buy low carbon ETFs to fight climate change. Like, <laughs> can you imagine an economist saying that? Like they'll get kicked out of the room. It's ridiculous. I actually looked up William Nordhaus is the guy who won the Nobel in economic, uh, Nobel Prize in economics 2018. First of all, the guy gives a talk in Stockholm a few days before he gets it. And he like tells some story about how he had gone to his grad student notes and he found like carbon tax or something and some like scribbled down. And I'm watching it. I'm like, this guy looks like he's 70 years old, right? Like how, how long have we known this? This is what I, what I wrote in 1977. And it's, it's, I haven't gone much further than this. Uh, because of the externalities, there are no market or political mechanisms which ensure that the appropriate level of control will be chosen. 
To implement the efficient path implies that we are implicitly putting a positive price on emissions of carbon into the atmosphere, quote, carbon taxes, um, as a way of implementing the global policy on a decentralized level. And so he's been saying it for decades, and it's like, he's never once talked about a low carbon ETF. He's never talked about ESG integration. Like, these are not effective ways to create impact. They're also not effective ways to invest, I would add. A lot of folks, I think, don't really, haven't really figured out yet that that's kind of what it is. But getting into the mentality a little bit more, though, earlier you talked about the dichotomy in worldview between 68-year-old CEO and kind of your line workers who are 20, 30, maybe 40 years old. I mean, the 68-year-old guys, you know, if he's CEO of a large company, he's worth, you know, blah, hundred million probably. Like, why the f does he keep the pedal to the metal? And why doesn't he, why isn't he the person who can say, hey, we need to pump the brakes here. We need to change things up. Um, I mean, look, what, what's, what prevents him from being that agent of change? I don't think anything is prevent. I mean, on some level, it's not in their financial interest, right? So that one of the challenges is that CEO compensation is the highest it's been in decades. It's now 320 times the average worker in that industry. CEO tenure is also the shortest it's been in decades, right? It's five years, you know. And so they're getting paid a lot of money and not staying around for very long, right? And maybe in certain previous business eras, there were like 10 or 15 years. Now it's five years. So they're not paid to care about long-term issues like climate change, right? No matter what. Like in the near term, it's cheaper to market and pretend you're doing something than it is to actually make the long invest term investments that pay off in 10 or 20 years. So you're kind of relying on them being ethical, right? Because frankly, at a systemic level, we know the system's going to operate according to their incentives and these people are controlling all this stuff. Don't, you know, they have short term incentives. And so, you know, in theory, any of them can stand up as an individual or as a former business leader, because maybe it's harder for an acting CEO and just say, listen, like we clearly need some smart regulation in key areas, right? It would be kind of like, a, you know, we're playing on the field and on the soccer field or basketball or whatever. And we say, like, at some point, like, where's the referee? Because like the game, you know, it's deteriorated and you don't tend to see them do that here and there. Like sometimes they'll basically say, oh, we need like a carbon tax because it's systemic or they'll do this, that. But there's nowhere as near as much support for government action as there needs to be. Right. Like most of the business lobbies are still saying the same old, the less taxes and regulation, the better. And they've been built to say that. Right. So they're going to say that regardless of any kind of a systemic crisis that hits that, you know, can't be solved individually and requires collective action. They're not going to adapt until like, you know, we're basically dead. So on some, so some level, they're just going to keep saying the same thing that they're doing that. But, um, you know, leaders, I think they could stand up individually or former CEOs, but you tend not to see that happening yet. Instead, they're kind of putting their stock on stakeholder capitalism. And it's like, listen, of course they should do as much as they can for all stakeholders. Like it's common sense, like treat your workers well. You know, there's a whole bunch of these things that they absolutely should be doing, but they have to also be very clear that like there's issues that they cannot solve. They require collective action. Just like we couldn't have, imagine trying to bend down the COVID-19 curve. And then we're like, we government can't do anything. It's a free market. Like we'd be going door to door and telling people to wear masks. Like, it, like literally it's what divestment is. Fossil fuel divestment is like one by one, you know, let's get the market by telling this bank they can't lend. And at some point you're like, it's like playing whack-a-mole against like 10,000 Mold, right? It's ridiculous. You're taking a cup of water out of the ocean. And so that's why every year we see these amazing sounding initiatives, right? They're like, we're doing this and something like 60% of investment assets use ESG integration and all this crap. And then somehow all the things, you know, all the actual ENS issues go in the wrong direction. One of the things though, that you also point out in your, in your essay that I think is really interesting and um, not something I was aware of, obviously in capitalist economies, especially the United States, we really pray at the altar of Milton Friedman and this idea of shareholder capitalism. But you point out that that's actually been perverted over the years and that Milton Friedman was not necessarily or that he was not in favor of these externalities run amok because he believed in the segregation of the civic you know, the civil servant in that role from that of business. Can you explain this more and yeah, really what this, what this perversion is and 
how you think it came to be. Yeah, it's an interesting one, right? Everybody quotes that famous paper Milton Friedman wrote in 1970. He said it's basically the idea of the primacy of shareholder value, right? He said the sole purpose of a you know uh, of you know management, whatever, is create value for shareholders, right? Meaning profits, create profits for shareholders. There's no social goals or anything, and so that has ushered in an era where business has been built from the ground up to do that, right? I don't, again, I'm a capitalist. I don't say that disparagingly. I say that realistically, right? That's how, you know, they've been built to operate fine. Um, <clears throat> and so when everyone started getting upset at some point and saying, hey, not, not enough being done for society. A few years ago, these guys came out and they tried to diverge from it. They said, oh, we believe in stakeholder capital. Like Friedman was wrong. And the ridiculous thing is that Friedman didn't just go out and say like, businesses should only focus on um, profits and then like nobody should focus on society, right? Like he, it wasn't like he was like, no, there should be no referee. He, he understood the need for government. He generally in most papers was, was, you know, didn't like regulation for sure, but he understood the need for public education, right? Because it creates value for all of us. If we're all literate, he understood the need for government in certain areas. And in that same paper in 1970, he basically says that business leaders shouldn't take, as, as you referenced, the, the jobs away or the, the role of government officials, because it'd be, he'd be, you know, basically on political principle, he called it intolerable, right? Because they're not elected leaders. So they don't, they really should be making big societal decisions like that. Um, you know, they can operate within their lane and compete within the rules, right? Because there is no free market. There's always rules, as goes without saying. And so they can operate within those rules, but they can't really be setting those rules or have the rules disappear, be 30 years out of date. And then they're solving social problems because they're not built to do that. They're not elected or chosen by us, right? It's just, it, it's, it's a violation of basic democratic principles. And the funny thing is that, and every time people talk about Friedman, they say, oh, he said this shareholder value only, but now it's stakeholder value. They never mentioned that he did talk about an alternative, right? That it was government. And so I liken it to like, if the athletes on the field have been playing dirty for decades and they, you know, they took the like, you know, the rule book in the seventies, and then they tore out all the bits on ref rules and refereeing and they hit it. And they gave you an updated section on good sportsmanship. And they said, that's the answer. And it's like, well, no, like even in his model, there was a role for government. And he lived in a different era, but I'm almost certain he would have looked at climate change and had said the science is clear. And by the way, the policy is clear also, right? We need to fix market failures. And then capital markets will do their job, you know, once you've adjusted it so that you disincentivize things we don't want and you incentivize things we want more of, right? Like, you know, it'll make green stuff far more competitive and, and generally move us in that direction a lot faster.